time. James Reston Jr.'s Defenders of the Faith recounts the conflict between Islam and Christianity from 1520 to 1536, focusing on the Roman Empire and the Ottoman Turks. The inaugural Gaithersburg Book Festival hosts the 40-minute event. Some of you, I suppose, are old enough to remember late-night television that was dominated by Johnny Carson. Um, and that was a, a time in which late-night television didn't necessarily depend for its jokes on scatological material. And he had a particularly fun gig that he would do from time to time called Karnak the Magnificent. Remember Karnak the Magnificent? Had a great thing like this. And the, the uh, uh, premise of this whole thing was that Karnak was just had such a great sense of the psychic that he could divine what the, what the, um, uh, the question was if Ed McMahon gave him the answer. So if Ed McMahon said, sis boom ba, then Karnak the Magnificent would think for a while and say, the question is, what is the sound of a sheep exploding? <laughs> well, I thought I'd do something like that, not um, quite, uh, quite as interesting, um, where the Ed McMahon in this thing says the answer is history. So what are the questions? The questions are as follows. Why? would a radical group in Palestine call itself the Saladin Brigades? Why would Spain resist the funding of mosques in southern Spain now? Why was it such a disaster when George W. Bush proclaimed a crusade only six days after 9-11? And why did Donald Rumsfeld try to scare us at the thought of a worldwide Islamic caliphate? Uh, why in Istanbul nowadays is the reenactment of the capture of Constantinople in 1453 such a popular event every single year? And why in this controversy of whether Turkey should enter the European Union does Austria resist that entry more vociferously than any other country in Europe? Well, the answer to all of those questions is history. Uh, Defenders of the Faith is, as he mentioned, um, the completion of a series, a quintet, I like to think, um, that began in the 1990s uh, with my biography of Galileo. I uh, have tried in these five books to focus on what I regard to be uh, exciting and relevant um, episodes in uh, history in the first 600 years of um, of the history of Europe since the year 1000 that are real turning points in the history of Western civilization, but that they lend themselves to literary technique, telling a story that is absolutely accurate, but reads like a novel. That's the guiding principle here. And indeed, I have a guiding principle from Virginia Woolf in all of this who wrote a wonderful essay uh, called The Art of Biography, in which he said that great biography does not include all the facts, but it includes only what she refers to as the fertile facts, or the, um, uh, and by fertile facts, the essential facts, she means the creative facts, she calls them, facts that elucidate character. So great biography is not everything you can throw in from the, into the kitchen sink, but a sifting process in which the author looks for only those fertile or creative facts which elucidate the character at the center of the story. I have used that principle uh, really in 35 years of writing both fiction and, uh, and nonfiction. So in this case, 
it is a process of f first and foremost, uh, if you're going to tell a, a period of history, in this case 1520 to 1536, who are the indispensable characters? Who are the most important characters? And who are the characters that you can discard? In this case, we have the fabulous conflict between Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and Suleiman the Magnificent. But then once you decide who your indispensable characters are, then it's a question of limiting the number of scenes where you stitch together not facts, but to sit, sit, uh, uh, stitching together scenes that can be linked and give a narrative its driving, uh, driving force. So I like to think that what I have done, particularly in this quintet of historical works, is to reach for what I would call historical literature, as opposed to straightforward um, history. And then taken together, these five books give us, you know, critical moments in, in European history from the year of 1000, starting with that year as the turning point uh, when, when uh, the Spain was almost entirely Islamic and the transition then began towards the Spanish reconquest, Christian reconquest of Spain that went on for another 500 years. From there I have leapt to the third crusade of Richard the Lionheart in 18, 18 in 1187 to 92 when crusade and jihad came into classic conflict. From there I went to 1492, not so much to focus on the voyage of Christopher Columbus, but to focus on the Spain out of which Columbus came. And had it not been for the completion of the Spanish Inquisition in 1492 in March, and then the, uh, the defeat of the Moors in January of 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella would not have authorized Columbus's voyage, and I think that's very little understood in, in, America, in America, that um, that the discovery of the New World by Columbus was so linked to the Spanish Inquisition and the defeat of the Islamic South. Then to this period, 1520 to 1536, <coughs> when the Turks of the Ottoman Empire, Suleiman Ma the Magnificent in particular, comes from Istanbul north uh, to the very gates of Vienna with a massive army. And had he prevailed in 1529 and then in 1532, then Europe would have been Islamic to the Rhine River in the 16th century. And of course, the history of, of Europe would have been entirely different. And I end, although I began in, with the Galileo story, I end this now as I put these books together with the, with the story of Galileo in which, you know, I, I think of it as the beginning of modern history when uh, Galileo turns his spyglass towards Jupiter, sees the dynamic movement of the moon, moons of Jupiter around, um, around the planet and d divines that indeed, you know, the earth is not the center of the universe as the church wanted it to be, but that, uh, that the sun is the center. Well, you can see from these, um, these five books that of four of the five in particular focus on a fascination of mine, and that is the conflict of Christianity and in Islam in history. I um, don't think I have to tell you how relevant that theme is since 9-11. In fact, my book on the Third Crusade of, of, of Richard Lionheart and Saladin was published in 2001, just before 9-11. And it's now, as mentioned, has been translated into 13 languages because it's, it is such a classic case post 9-11 of the clash of Christianity and Islam, of crusade versus jihad. So with 9-11, everything changed, including how history is written. Uh, Americans seemed to believe with 9-11 that they were the only ones that experienced this kind of clash. And it seemed to me important to point out in the history of Spain or of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire, um, 
um, and with the Third Crusade, how uh, central this theme, theme has been from time to time at other points in history. So I have, in some ways, endeavored to focus on the high points of Islamic history with some of their greatest heroes, Saladin in the 12th century and Suleiman the Magnificent in the 16th century, because it seems to me 9-11, post 9-11, that it's very important for us to know what are the great stories, who are the great heroes uh, and for the Islamic and Arab world, because it is the nostalgia about that kind of history that I think is very much part of the political sensibility of the Arab world now. And if you want to concern yourself with the security of the United States, it's also a very important part of the radicalization of Islamic fundamentalists. Now, um, I taught creative writing at the University of North Carolina for 10 years. And when I would teach students about writing fiction, because I'm now at the end of writing my third novel, I would always talk about the basic elements of fish fiction writing, of good fiction writing. And they are um, character and setting and plot and dialogue. Well, those elements are also centrally important to the uh, writing of nonfiction. So in this particular case, when I set out to write about this clash, uh, the indispensable characters became Charles V and Suleiman. But it's astonishing how many other extraordinary figures of history, titanic figures of history, were on the stage in Europe at the same time. You had Francis I in France, Henry VIII in England. The whole revolution of Martin Luther begins uh, during this period. You had in Rome two woebegone popes, Leo X and Clement VII. You had a quite fascinating figure who was the right hand of Suleiman the Magnificent by the name of Ibrahim Pasha, and a wonderful lover of Suleiman the Magnificent a woman by the name of Roxolana, who is uh, of great fascination even now. Novels are written about her. So those are the characters of Defenders of the Faith. The setting is medieval Constantinople, medieval roads, and then the Balkan Peninsula where this movement north by the Islamic forces to the gates of Vienna takes place where some of the great battles are. So you have Vienna, and then you have secondary plots happening in Italy at the same time, where there is competition between the Christian potentates of Charles V and Francis I and Henry VIII. But it is that central dramatic high point of uh, the, the um, assault on Vienna in 1529-32 that is really the relevant moment for today. and. If we go back to my Karnak the Magnificent question of why is it that Austria so resists uh, the entry of Turkey into the European Union today, it goes back to the clashes uh, at their very gates in 1529. You also have the Martin Luther story here. As a true 1960s character, uh, I, would, um, I was completely uh, uh, in love with Martin Luther. He is truly in your face in every way. And so here you have in a secondary plot a fabulous character and a fabulous secondary plot that quite relates to whether or not the Christian world is able to re resist the assault of the Islamic world uh, on its center. There is even in this work um, another resonance to the current day, which is the com conflict between Sunnism and, and the Shiite world, because Suleiman the Magnificent, with his empire that stretches almost to India and almost to the, uh, to the center of Vienna and down to Algiers on the Mediterranean, 
um, you um, you also have this struggle uh, of uh, of Islam between Shiism and Sunnism, and it was one of uh, Suleiman's great uh, movements after he failed at Vienna to uh, move on uh, Tehran and and Tabriz and the East in order to consolidate Islam under one ideology. In that too, he was not entirely uh, successful. So I would present to you here that this is um, very, very rich material, but it is formed in a way very carefully by the, by the author to be a kind of dual biography where you have these, this clash of epic and iconic figures um, has resonance f in my own work for the clash between Richard the Lionheart and Saladin 300 years before. Uh, but going back to that sifting question, it is always that process of what to include and what to discard. And every good historian, in my view, works very hard to identify that. It's a great sifting, sifting process. I have constructed uh, uh, Defenders of the Faith as a ten-act drama. I suppose it's because I'm also very interested in the theater. Um, uh, and I'm painting here on a very large canvas. But the choice of f facts, the choices of years is critical. And how to end a story, because, you know, uh, the history just seems to just dribble on and on. Um, so, where do you end it? This is a book, as I said, which um, has, I think, strong modern connections. Turkey and the European Union, the struggle in the Balkans with this patchwork of communities, Christian and Islamic and Jewish. It is relevant to the Kosovo controversy. It is relevant to Obama going to the Middle East, first to Istanbul, and then to Cairo to uh, offer a reconciliation of America to the Islamic world after 9-11 and after George Bush. Um, it's relevant to the question of Turkish immigration into Europe and whether, um, you know, for example, the Shador should be banned in France or whether minarets should be banned in Switzerland. All these things are being worked out in Europe. The, there is burning of immigrant houses in various German towns. So this is uh, the resonance of this story and other historical stories from the, from the Middle Ages that I think the resonance for the current situation in Europe. Um, I thought I might end by reading you a, an example of the technique at work here. Uh, an author who begins as a novelist, uh, very interested in character, plot, setting, and dialogue. I didn't mention dialogue, but it's possible if you dig and dig and dig in the Library of Congress, where I tend to hang out a lot, uh, after medieval stories, that you can find ways that people talked to one another in the Middle Ages, because every novelist knows that it is, is when people speak to one another that the real issue is joined. It's like the classic thing that they say in the theater. One character says to another, you know, I want to talk about such and such, and the other character says, no, I don't want to talk about that now. Let's talk about it later. And the first character says, no, we're going to talk about it right now. That's the essence of conflict. That's the essence of drama right there and that kind of thing. So I have always, in my historical work, um, searched and searched and searched to find from the medieval chronicles ways in which the main characters actually talk to one another. Well, Suleiman the Magnificent failed at the gates of Vienna. And when he got back to Constantinople, he wanted everybody to forget about this failure. So he had three sons, and 
he decided to have a ceremony of circumcision for these sons, which is a great event in the Islamic world. And this was meant to be a kind of ceremony of amnesia for the Ottoman Empire to forget the failures at Vienna. So I thought I would conclude by reading you this, um, this passage. Soon enough, the parades and games began. Artisans of various guilds paraded floats with their wares before the imperial grandstand. There were circus acts and concerts and musical plays. Soldiers engaged in mock battles, assaulting wooden towers with muskets and swords, and whoever prevailed was rewarded with beautiful slave girls or handsome boys. A new game was inaugurated, a contest of throwing long sticks. Its inventor, a renowned mathematician, was lavished with gifts for his creativity. Foot races and chariot races were held, and even combat between wild animals. In one such event, the German ambassador offered a sacrificial wild boar to fight a lion. To the dismay of the Turks, the boar, which had one leg tied with a rope anchored to a stake, comported itself quite ably dispatching two lions. With the last lion, wrote an observer, the hog tumbled him over and over in the dust before this lion shamefully ran away. This happened to the great confusion of the Turks who compare themselves to lions and compare Christians, especially Germans, to hogs. <laughs> in the evenings, the mosques of the city were illuminated, and when this light mixed with that of fireworks and burning wooden towers, Constantinople took on an orange glow. At the Seraglio, uh, elaborate banquets were put on in which lambs were sacrificed the custom in uh, circumcision ceremonies, and sheep were roasted whole. And when the latter came off the spit and were presented to the throng, birds suddenly flew from the charred cavities of their carcasses. Jugglers and acrobats performed for the banqueteers, the sultan and his sensual, cunning, and self-assured Roxolana entered with high ceremony. Suleiman presided over the festivities seated on a magnificent throne and surrounded by Roxolana and the other ladies of the court, while black eunuchs and slave girls known by the names of flowers, lotus blossom, little rose leaf, splendor of the tulip, and dressed in chemise and transparent, billowing sky blue silk, served his food. Court gardeners passed through the assemblage carrying baskets of fragrant flowers while the scent of amber perfume and oriental spices waft through the reception hall next to the fountain in the court of the favorites. Where am I? A high point came when a specialist stepped forward to ply the ancient art of reading the prophecy in the sultan's coffee grounds and whispering the results into his ear. The fabulous orchestra of the harem provided the music, its melodies anchored by the halting plucked notes of the kanun, the rattle of the tambourine, the strains of the viol that Ibrahim played so well, the thumps of the derbuka. Dancers emerged from the wings, their faces smeared with a mixture of almond paste and wi white jasmine. At a climactic moment, which was greeted with great anticipation, the sultan released one of his favorites from the harem and, uh, harem and presented her to a loyal dignitary as a wife. When the gorge drew to an end, buckets of multicolored sorbet, crushed ice mixed with the snow of Mount Olympus, flavored with violet and lemon, were brought forward. As the Turks feasted and the city glowed, one Western observer or uh, whispered that the aureole of the city announced to the shepherds in the mountains of Asia and to the sailors on the Sea of Marmara the orges, orgies of the new Babylon. Suleiman was well pleased with his great feast of amnesia. Finally, on the 18th day, the three princes, ages 15, 9, and 6, rode through the streets in the midst of a rowdy throng of youths their own age. They were led by heralds carrying candles attached to palm fronds and a contingent of half-naked former unbelievers 
who held in their left hands darts pointing towards their hearts as a confession that the weapons would have pierced their hearts if they had not finally embraced Islam. Along the way, the princes were presented with baskets of fruit and flowers. On the balcony of Ibrahim Pasha's mansion, the Suleiman awaited, the Sultan awaited his sons for in affection and as an honor to Ibrahim, the circumcision was to be performed at the Grand Vizier's residence. As Suleiman and Ibrahim watched the remarkable conclusion to the carnival, Suleiman turned to his friend. In your opinion, Ibrahim, between the two magnificent ceremonies of your wedding to my sister and the circumcision of my sons, which was the most spectacular? So Ibrahim says, a wedding like mine, your excellence, has never been seen since the world has existed and will never be seen again. The weddings had, festivals had lasted 15 days. How so, said the Sultan? Because your majesty, you have many splendid guests here, but no one can compare with the guest I had at my wedding, the Padishah of Mecca and Medina, the Solomon of our time, blessed my wedding with his presence. Shall you be blessed a thousand times, Suleiman replied at this flattery, for over the years you have set me straight countless times. <laughs> How to end a book? How to end a book? The book ends with the garroting of Ibrahim of Pasha by Suleiman the Magnificent. for questions, and uh, uh, after which uh, Mr. Russell will be signing copies of his book. You can obtain the books at the uh, book uh, booth. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry. You mentioned that it was possible to reconstruct medieval dialogue. What sources do you have you found those? That is your best one. Um, I think um, by the general public, the general reading public, it's not quite understood that there are chronicles of medieval history. Um, they, of course, vary greatly in their um, literary quality and in their description of events. Um, but along the way in these criticals, you can the chronicles, you can find interchanges that take place. And when you come upon an, uh, uh, such an interchange like that last one that I read from there, it's like mana from heaven. It's just absolutely a golden moment because of, of the, um, the bringing together of the conflict of character uh, in as people speak to one another. And usually those things, when they exist, have to do with, with conflict of one sort or another. So. Those are, those are the rewards for the long agony of, of uh, usually three years in my case of, um, of crashing the, all the sources that you can find. Now, it's somewhat difficult when you, when you take on a Turkish subject, for example, if you don't speak Turkish. Um, but it turns out that, uh, that a lot of the um, the primary sources are, are some of the most critical primary sources, I should say, uh, from Turkish history are translated into French and German. So uh, I have a little bit of um, German, and I have an intern who is from both uh, Germany and France, and he's fluent in both languages, and that's helpful. Um, in the case of the book on the Third Crusade, um, there are really quite a lot of chronicles about the Crusades, so that you can, it's, it became a little bit easier in that work to, to, to find such a moment. Um, I have a question about uh, I've always been taught to 
Yes. This is a story about 1492 in the connection of, um, of the Inquisition and the defeat of the Moors um, uh, that uh, made it possible for Columbus to be authorized to make his, uh, his, his mission. Columbus is an, is an interesting character. Um, I never said it quite that way before, but uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, I was totally disinterested in his voyage. What I was interested in was the environment from which he came, <laughs> and also when he came back. Those, uh, so I completely avoided the, the, uh, the voyage itself. And, you know, he's a very, very determined character. He is, he desperately wants to make this uh, thing, and he hangs around and hangs around. He, it appears from the sources that he's really quite a charming fellow and rather um, catches the eye of Isabella and all of this. But Isabella is a, um, is a religious fanatic and uh, she was schooled by Torquemada, the Grand Inquisitor, one of the great evil characters of, of history. And so she was consumed with the, uh, the question of the purity of uh, Christianity and of, the, of the, um, the final Christian reconquest of Spain over the Moors of the South. Ferdinand, not as much a fanatic, but as a kind of empire builder and um, uh, a military sensibility, wanted to complete this for his own glory, to, to uh, capture Granada and Cordoba and the, the great Islamic um, uh, towns, particularly Granada of, of uh, southern Spain. So that was what, was what was on his mind. So in Ferdinand's mind, the conquest of Granada was his consuming interest. In Isabella's mind, it was the purity of Christian faith and the and the um, uh, either the forcible conversion of Jews to Christianity uh, or their expulsion, and it was the expulsion that Torquemada was pushing from the from the very beginning, and to, to the disgrace of Isabel, Isabella, she collapses to this sort of thing. So, 1492 begins in January with the surrender of Granada. Um, and so that completes Ferdinand's obsession. And then in March of 1492 is the expulsion order for the, uh, for the Jews, and that, that satisfies Isabella. And at that point, this determined Columbus goes back to the, to the monarchs and says, OK, those things are finished now. Please authorize me. And so off he, off he goes. So I think that's a little appreciated. The, uh, in, um, and those who study American history, this very, very important connection. Yes, sir. I, I missed the beginning when you hear the comments that you listened to the really question. The expulsion order was only for Jews, or was it for the special as well? Or were they trying to get someone different? The in expulsion order, was it for, uh, uh, for the Moors as well as the, uh, the Jews? The expulsion order in March of 1492 was for the Jews. Um, and in the surrender of Granada in 1492 in January, uh, it is said by the monarchs that they will allow the practice of Islam to carry on as before, even af after they've been conquered. That lasts for 10 years, and then there is an expulsion order um, for the uh, for the Moors around 1501, so they get they get exactly what the Jews get, but 10 years later. And in modern politics, this is both of these things are very important. If you look at it from the standpoint of the Islamic fundamentalist today, you know there is a kind of kind of dream fantasy that goes on that someday, you know, Islam will again return to Spain. And that it will, there will again be a great Islamic culture in Spain that will light up the world as 
Granada and Seville and Cordoba did for 500 years. So that becomes part of the radicalization uh, thing. And also that sort of return to Spain from North, North Africa, from the descendants of, uh, of those who were expelled in uh, 1501 is, is also very much part of the historical argument. Go ahead. Say it. Shout out. No, it's, it's, it's a new point, and it's an interesting point. Whether um, economics or, um, you know, the, uh, the obsessions of great leaders, for example, are more important in the shaping of history. There are, of course, many historians, maybe it's the dominant strain in history, in the writing of history, who feel that economic forces are the central driving force of history. I, as a novelist, am totally disinterested in that. You know, I'm interested in the characters, and you know, the, the sort of the professional historians have long poo-pooed this great man th uh, theory of history that it's really there are underlying forces that are much Im more important than the characters. Maybe it, maybe they're right. I don't care. Um, you know, <laughs> um, so you know, I I'm interested in character and I'm interested in good stories. I think of myself more as a storyteller than, than anything else, but it's a perfectly valid way to, to approach history from the standpoint of economic forces. Uh, those of us who are the gray of hair and lost our teeth remember the journalism that you did during Watergate. And so I'm very impressed with your tremendously deep philosophical look at history. Have you changed your views of Mr. Nixon and the Watergate crew in the, in the time since then, now that you're, you two are great apparent? <laughs> no. <laughs> the, um, the, um, the question is about uh, have I changed it all as a result of the experience with uh, Nixon interviews and David Frost. Um, no, I, you know, they say you're supposed to moderate as you get older, right? You see, and, and there are some famous cases, John Despasos is a good case in this, uh, on this point about, you know, those who are liberal when they're young become bedrock conservatives when they get much older. Um, I haven't changed a whit about Nixon. And um, I think that story, if you saw the movie, um, you, you know, I feel just as strongly today as I did in 1976 that his criminality had to be proven. Um, the American people had thrown him out of office and the uh, stakes were enormous in those interviews because it was the only time history would ever have when Nixon would be confronted with his criminality. And because he was such an intimidating figure, and because David Frost was such a silly man in many ways, um, the possibility here was that um, Nixon would win, Frost would lose, and all of the American people would start to think maybe we made a mistake in throwing Nixon out of office. So, uh, as I say, I feel absolutely as strongly today as, as I did then that, you know, Frost had to have the weapons uh, at his disposal and the technique and the strategy to, um, to confirm and validate the uh, decision of America to throw Nixon out of office. Thank you. 
Um, could you say a little bit about Luther in your book and how he intersected with, or his movement intersected with uh, this uh, threat posed by Sewell? Yes, would I say something about Martin Luther? Sometimes when you write, write books like this, you, um, you have to be careful when one character is so fascinating or one set of circumstances is so fascinating that you spend too much time on it. And that was in a way a danger for me and Defenders of the Faith. I had faced this once before in a biography in the late uh, 1980s of John Connolly that I wrote, getting so consumed with the Dallas assassination. And I just had to sort of declare an end to writing about that at that, that point. In the case of Martin Luther, um, he's uh, very, very important because here comes Islam uh, the, for the infidel forces uh, into the center of Europe. And would uh, all of the Christian world uh, combine together to, uh, to resist this entry of, of this infidel faith? Uh, and the problem about presenting a consolidated front to um, uh, to um, Suleiman the Magnificent and the, and the Ottomans uh, was this revolt from within by Martin Luther against the, uh, 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 the uh, corruption of Rome. So, uh, so it becomes very, very important in, in that uh, sense. Here in America, uh, we tend to, to focus a lot more on Henry VIII as the, as the progenitor of Protestantism not at all. Martin Luther is the central revolutionary uh, figure here, and uh, it is his his um, his his attitude towards Rome and towards authority generally, and his his the strength of his character that is central in that um, in that revolutionary quest. It's a great story. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. James Reston, Jr. is a journalist, playwright, and author whose radio documentary, Father Cares, The Last of Jonestown, won the DuPont Columbia Award. He's a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. For more information, visit restonbooks.com. This weekend on Book TV, on Sunday, starting at 1, the Roosevelt Reading Festival. Authors talk about their books on FDR, his politics.